Well, that brings us to our text tonight. Uh, all those who believed were together and they had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone would have need. Good Lord. So they really got carried away. They're selling their property, their real estate. That's your investment, man. That's your that's your security. Whoa, that doesn't sound... We get a further description. A little later, it comes back to this point of how generous they were, how sacrificial they were. In chapter 4, all the believers, we read, are were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. Well, you may not be aware of this, but the Bible clearly teaches that. And I like Psalms chapter 24, verse 1, says, The earth is the Lord and all that's in it. God owns this place. You say, well, I've got some money. That's not your money. Okay? That money belongs to God. You belong to God, too. The whole universe belongs to God. So, I might have some money in my hand that I get to be a steward of, that I can like handle for a while, but it's not really mine. I'm handling it for God. That's the, that's the biblical point of view. They had that. In 33, it says, The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. For all who were owners of land or houses would sell those and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet. So then they, then they could be distributed to each as any had need. Isn't that something? So this, this was radical. Man, poverty had become obsolete in this group. There was not a needy person among them. In spite of the fact that we know, uh, based on the book of Hebrews, and other sources as well. Per Christians were under intense persecution. And one of the most common punishments was to have all of their property seized by the government. People put out on the street without a house, without anything. We know that many of the believers who were visiting Jerusalem during Pentecost from other countries met God, had this experience with the Holy Spirit. They decided to stay there. And to learn more before they went back home. So there was a sizable group of people. They had no jobs. They had no way to feed themselves. And of course, it was a poor culture anyway, where people generally were poor. There was no social security. There was no welfare in the Roman system. And we see in Acts how they were feeding the widows and the poor in this uh, city. And, uh, and they needed money. They basically had a lot of poor people and they had to take care of them. They had again banished poverty from this group. Wow. Now, it wasn't an actual commune where everybody pools all their possessions. We can see that it was not universal, like it was voluntary. You know, some people did this, others did not. But, but there was a lot of this sharing of property going on. The reason we can tell that it wasn't universal and that it was voluntary, for instance, comes later in Acts verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 4, where Peter points out to Ananias, while your property remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And even after you sold it, was it not still under your control? So in other words, it's clear from this interaction here that, that, was, that there was no uh, like... If you're going to be in our group, you have to surrender all your property to the group and have a central pot. That never happened. And it was voluntary. People were like, well, I feel like it. I feel led to. Uh, Barnabas sold attractive land and specifically names him. So this is, uh, this is an amazing feature. And I love this part of the story because, you know, this is objective. I mean... It's one thing to say people were, you know, had heartfelt love for one another. But how do we really know that? And when this kind of stuff starts going on, that's pretty objective there. They're, 
They're way out beyond like charitable giving. Like we can today, we can give some money to charity and our lifestyle is not even affected. You know, we're just as affluent as we ever were. You hardly even notice any difference. But we're talking about sacrificial giving here. That is, uh, you know, liquidating even my, my assets. And it does raise the question of what would it be like if you had a body of people like this and they're not sacrificial. That would be a flat contradiction of everything Jesus taught. Jesus lived sacrificially. He said of when one guy wanted to follow him, he says, have you noticed that the birds have nests they live in and foxes have holes that they can live in? The son of man, myself, he says, has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was so poor, he was literally living from one day to the next. Voluntarily. And, well, he went to the cross. <laughs> I mean... Uh, yeah, he was sacrificial, all right. And, and he taught, I want you guys to learn to love one another the way I love you. And that's what they were doing. They were, they were, they were like, so he's not kidding. And they're like, you know, I, I own a piece of property over here. I'm, I could make it without that. They would liquidate it and bring the money in. And it would be distributed to the poor. Wow. I think this is something for us to think about here as a group, us personally, because I know a lot of us here believe in many in this whole story and this whole account, and we fit the description here in many ways, and yet some of us do not give. And I'd like to call that to your conscience. Is that right? I know as students we don't have a lot of money or anything, but I think it's the principle of the matter, you know? Something, to give something regularly to start developing the habit of giving it's biblical this is this is the way of god that he teaches us and if you can't give now when you have little money believe it or not it will be even harder to give when you have lots of money it doesn't get easier people think i used to think as a student well you know when i'm making an income i'll worry about that right now i can't even afford cigarettes and, uh, you know, so my original giving, my first giving commitment when I when God brought me under conviction, I started to, to realize, you know, I really can't explain why I'm not giving. And I believe the Bible. And so I think I should give something and stuff like that. I made a commitment to give. And my my weekly commitment was a quarter. Now, quarters were worth a lot more back then, okay? I'd like to point that out. That would be like a dollar or two today. But uh, per week, you know, it wasn't much, even, even by that standard. But it was, it was beginning to concretely do something. And that is what's important, is that we begin to participate in the great task of giving ourselves away and hell, yes, that includes our wallet. Why wouldn't it include our wallet if we are saying we're all sacrificial and stuff, but not my money? I don't think so. As a matter of fact, sacrificial giving is a lot more objective than all our spiritual talk. And it's so easy to say all these spiritual sounding things. Show me a person who's, who's got all the spiritual ideas and thoughts and stuff, but is not a giver. That's like a faker. That's totally uncool. Well, they weren't this way. I mean, so you had here a powerful, potent statement of sacrificial generosity. They were imitating Jesus Christ, which is that's the way he lived and that's the way they were living. Verse 46. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness. And sincerity of heart. Okay, so there's that expression with one mind, which suggests that they were very unified, doesn't it? That there, there's a great unity working in this group. The unity of the body of Christ is a divine fact. 
We don't create unity in the body of Christ. God already did that. He made us individually members of one body, or uh, corporately members of one body and individually members of one another. What we have to do is preserve that unity. What we have to do is to live out that unity that God has already put in. Later in the New Testament, Paul, writing to the Philippians, talks about unity in the body of Christ. In chapter 2, verse 2 of Philippians, he says, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind. And this is the same expression that we see here. This word for mind or soul, it's having a common soul. Our value system, our worldview that we share, we're of one mind about the way the world is. We see, we see this together. Uh, secondly, maintaining the same love. So yes, there is agreement. There is consensus, powerful, unified consensus about what matters in this world, about what is true about this world. Uh, but there is also relationship. Uh, it has to be, it's not just, uh, this is not an impersonal like agreement like a political party or something like that. This is way about beyond that. And we already saw that building deep relationships is, is key, is, is a core of this whole thing. Also, he says, united in spirit. Well, that's the part that God supplies there. Because we do share the same Holy Spirit. It's funny how in the Bible, sometimes in many passages, it's hard to tell whether it's referring to our spirit or the Holy Spirit. And it's because there is really no reason to distinguish. They become uni unified. They become one. And finally, too, a fourth basis is intent on one purpose. That's another basis for unity in the body of Christ is that we've got a mission here. God's given us something to do. And... So as we all come together and as fellow workers toward the mission that we're driving together toward, it gives us something bigger than ourselves. You know, that's very important. I think. That's totally important. Because if it's just like, well, we're just unified because, you know, this is all about us and we're cool. That kind of unity is going to implode. That is a corporately selfish type of unity. But when we are all directed outward and we're all pulling together in the same direction. And I love it when we really experience the unity in the, in the body of Christ. It's a great feeling. You know, this is really the feeling of belonging. When we talk about the unity of the body of Christ. And that's a galling sense that I think we all have in our heart is, you know, where do I belong? The need to belong. That's a basic human need built into us by God. And when you experience the unity in the body of Christ, you know you have this sense of belonging. You get to this point, and you're like, you're like you know, and you're like, now I know where I belong. I belong somewhere. This is the family of God. Great feeling. Wonderful experience to enjoy the unity of the body of Christ. There's so much disunity, discord, alienation in our world. Here we can come in and there's real unity. Man, is that cool. It also says they met in the temple. It was actually beside the temple. You couldn't, you couldn't go in. The, the temple was actually a very small building. This was uh, on the temple grounds, though. It was Solomon's portico is where they met. We'll see that when we get to chapter 3. Uh, it's a big, you know, football field size colonnade there. And that's where they were having their big public meetings, where the apostles would get up and speak there. And they also met from house to house. So they had large meetings and small meetings, both. That's an interesting, that's an interesting pattern. And it's, uh, it's well worth imitating. You can see why they did this. Large meetings are like this one would be our large meeting tonight. It's good. Good for several reasons. For one thing, how many people are really highly gifted to, you know, teach and preach the word of God? 
you know, when we get choices, imagine these guys could go down and listen to Peter <laughs> or John. And what a drag it would be if they just had home church meetings and they'd be like, oh, yeah, you guys got Peter in your home church, you know. <laughs> and, and so we never get to hear him anymore. This way they could share in those in those powerful uh, teaching gifts and say, you know, man, I hear James is going to be speaking this week. Let's go down and see what he's got to say. And uh, and that that makes a lot of sense. Also, the big meetings are, are good, I think, for the sake of anonymity. A lot of people would rather come and listen in a large meeting where the focus isn't on me. You know, now, I, I kind of felt that way. As a non-Christian, I didn't want to go to some like little group where people were going to get around me and I don't know what I thought would happen, thump their Bibles at me or something like that. But I would rather, you know, I would rather just sit back and just listen without anybody bugging me. And big meetings are good for that because, you know, who even knows who's here? And so you can listen to a presentation about the Word of God. It's also good for excitement when you when you see uh, large numbers of people that are caught up in what God's doing, you start to realize this is uh, this is having an impact. This is a this is a happening thing here. And I think large meetings are good for that. It gives us a sense of vision. This is a piece in First Timothy four three. He says to Timothy, Paul does until I get there, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. The reason for that is that getting up in the public venue where we get everybody together and we get the scriptures out is that is the best way to keep uh, to protect ourselves against false teaching and deception. The public reading of the scriptures, it's like you equip so many people to know their word that uh, uh, it becomes very a lot harder to deceive a group like that. And the evil one is always eager to deceive, but it's harder for him to deceive when everybody knows their word. And that's why the public reading of Scripture is taught. This is from a piece I've been working on lately. It's uh, I, without the preaching of the word, smaller groups tend to drift off and fizzle. And I've seen that happen. They need to see themselves as part of something larger. When leaders stand before the church and declare the word with passion and spiritual conviction, the whole church tends to unify around the truths of God. They see their way. They're called to account. They gain vision. That's what big meetings like this are good for. You know, is to all get together and all get on the same page as we, as we ply our way through the Word of God and let God speak to the whole body and gain a vision for ourselves as part of the whole body. So this, I really believe in large group meetings. They had small groups too, though. That's also important. A big meetings like this is not good enough. And you're not, you're not going to see what they saw. You're not going to see uh, the body of Christ lived out if you're just coming to big meetings like this. Small groups are more personal. There's where you're going to be able probably to make friends with people, uh, get to actually know people. The things that we discussed last week with the one another passages are not going to be carried out here. Those would be carried out in a smaller group. Small groups are good because they're interactive. There's too many of us here to, to have an interactive meeting. But in a smaller group, then uh, everyone gets to speak. It's to share their views. And so there's dialogue. There's interaction there. Uh, it's just more intimate. And I think it's essential, frankly, that we have smaller groups in our in our fellowship. We have house churches. And we also have cell groups that are smaller still, you know, that are male or male only or female only. Get the guys together. Sometimes the guys need to get together without the ladies listening in. And I'm sure the ladies feel exactly the same way. Don't need a bunch of guys sitting around listening in. To get down to bit our business, you know, and uh, I think it's really good. Then you have even smaller meetings where individuals will say, why don't you and I hang out this week? You know, and you'll see people 
I see it here at the study center all the time, you know, different people sitting at tables, they're hanging out, they're talking about their lives, they've got the Word open, they're praying together. And that kind of thing just goes on day in and day out. That's exactly what they did too. You see, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Uh, so table fellowship, you know, where you eat together, that's kind of cool. That's a very special type of deal there. And this last expression, the sincerity of heart, is a, an expression that means authenticity. It's referring to not being fakey, is what it means. Which, frankly... I think is is a big problem. Uh, in churches that I've been to, sometimes I've gotten this real creepy feeling that this just seems really fakey. And it's kind of because, you know, like I don't want to get, uh, I don't want to step on any more toes than necessary, but, you know, have you ever been to one of those things where you go to a church and then at a certain point in the service you have to stand up and turn around and and like introduce yourself to everybody and say, God bless you, brother, you know, or even or even in some churches, hugs, you know. And uh, I, I, it kind of makes my flesh crawl. OK, because it's not because I don't, you know, what bothers me about it uh, is that it seems like we're pretending like we're all, you know, a buddy, buddy, and close, and lovey, and all of this. And the fact of the matter is, we have no we have no knowledge of each other whatsoever. You know, uh, we're not engaged. There is no fellowship or body life going on here. But we're going to kind of pretend like there is. And they're complete strangers. I just I can't get into it. I think to myself, and I know uh, you know people. Uh, I guess maybe there's reasons for it. Some people even do this in their small groups. I went to one conference about small groups and they were showing that you could have like the guys line up on one side of the end of the room and the ladies on the other and you threw this ball back and forth. I can't remember how the game worked or whatever, but it was an icebreaker. You know, it was like, here's how you can break the ice and get get your group, you know, so of, you know, this is this is for home groups of a dozen, 15 people. OK. So you're going to throw the ball and, <laughs> you know, and have a little fun. And... <laughs> so, you know, I'm just I'm there throwing the ball and stuff. And I'm just like, why does this bother me so much? It's like, what what is it that's wrong with this? And I thought to myself, imagine a, imagine one of our home churches saying, OK, guys, let's line up and uh, let's do this with the ball. It'd be so stupid. Because it's like, why are we doing this? You know, it's like it's it's like you do that with people you don't know to, to break the ice. But if you walked into a real home church that you're a part of a community, you know, you know, those people already. There's no need to throw the ball with them. I mean, these are actually friends of ours. And uh, I don't know. Well, I don't want to get hung up on externals, but I do believe this. I think that authenticity is crucial. And uh, you know this probably as students today. Students are pretty cynical on the modern campus. And if they walk into something that they feel is not authentic, we can forget anything else. We all have nothing more to say to anybody. Once they, once they get become suspicious that this is not real. And I think people are watching for reality. And it better be there. And it is there. Thank the Lord. He was there with these guys, that's for sure. And we read they were praising God. So this was a grateful group, very thankful group. An important qualification in this description. This is, this is not an inconsequential uh, little, little thing thrown in here. Let's think about the story of the ten lepers. You know that story in the Gospels? There were ten guys that had leprosy, a deadly disease where this stuff gets all over you. It's, it kills you, your nerves and everything. Ten of them. Jesus came up and he said, OK, you guys go up and wash in the pool and uh, you're going to all be healed. 
They go walking up toward the city to, to do this washing that the law prescribed. On the way, they're like, dude, my leprosy just disappeared. I'm healed. And so it was a healing. One of them, like, turned around and walked back to Jesus and was like, awesome, I'm healed. Thanks for doing that. And we read in the Gospels that Jesus marveled. Jesus was astonished. He says, Were there, weren't there ten? Only this one came back to say thanks? It's not easy to get the Son of God to marvel about anything. Okay, He sees, saw most things come. He was not easy to take down. But it, it was like, here was something so astonishing that even God's Son was just there like, I can't believe this. What? So you were just walking along and all of a sudden your leprosy's gone. You're like, oh, that worked out. And you just continue on, just, you know, <laughs> whatever. Nobody thought to, to give thanks except for one out of ten. This story is a picture, folks, of you and me. That's the way we are most of the time. No matter how much God does for us. It just seems like, well, that should happen. You know, we just feel like, well, yeah, of course he did that. And what else, you know? What else would he do? And we think we deserve it. The infantile attitude is an attitude of deserving. It's an attitude where we're bitter about the things that God hasn't given us. We can all name things. And I'm really upset that I don't have this. I haven't, I haven't made it there. I'm missing something. We're not grateful for what we have been given. And this amounts to a pretty dark inner core of sin in the heart of humanity here. It's hard to really talk about much when it comes to humans that would be much worse than our lack of gratitude. Our lack of gratitude is really just saying, I deserve everything I've been given, and really more besides. And that is a serious spiritual problem. That is why this has to be opposed actively. We have to set apart time to sit down and think about, let's see now, what has God given me? Has He ever done anything for me? When we do this, it can become pretty exciting. The more we actually, in a, in a purposeful way, start to focus on all of the things that God's done for me, all that He is, uh, His acceptance of me, and so on, uh, a different perspective starts to take over. We start to see things as they really are. And uh, it's, it's a real lift because we start to realize, instead of feeling sorry for myself, we realize, I don't feel sorry for myself at all. I feel grateful. I feel thankful. I can't believe that I uh, have been blessed. As the saying goes, you know, each day when you wake up in the morning and you're not in hell, that's a good day. Because you should be in hell. And as Christians, we realize that. The fact that we are accepted by God, should we, there should be no ending to our thanksgiving. And that is something that if we want to be like these guys, we should focus on that. We need times of thinking this through. We read, too, that they had favor with all of the people. Well, this changed as time went on. We'll see. The story changes. A lot of people turned against them. But at this point, at least... Uh, they had favor with the people, which, which is telling us that they were culturally integrated or engaged with their culture. These guys weren't like a lot of uh, Christians today who flee away from their culture, who form Christian enclaves and their own Christian culture to hide from the wicked world around them. These people were outward they were out, engaged with people. They're probably good reason to think that they were out doing good deeds. 
that one of the reasons people favored them, it's like they may not agree with them, but it's the kind of thing where, you know, the, those Christians, I don't really believe what they do, but you got to admit, those are pretty cool people. Those are the nicest people in this city. We read from ancient historians how these plagues would come into Roman cities and the people were terrified when a plague would hit a city and they would just flee to the mountains to get away before they got infected. And the only ones that would stay and care for the sick and dying were the Christians. And many of the Christians would catch the, the disease and die. And they considered that the moral equivalent of martyrdom. Well, the pagan uh, culture was just astonished by this. They couldn't believe that Christians would risk their own lives to care for sick people, their own relatives in many cases, when, when their relatives would run away and say, that's your problem, pal, I, you know, I'm out of here. And then the Christians would come in and take care of their people. And this was the kind of thing that was leading people in the thousands and the hundreds of thousands to realize Jesus is real. He must be. And finally, we read that the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being rescued. Day by day, more and more people kept meeting Christ, kept having this encounter with God where you hear the claim that Jesus' death is, is God paying the penalty for your sin, that you can be forgiven uh, if you accept it and ask for His death to apply to you, uh, invite Him into your life. And then people uh, dare to, to try that, to actually call out to God and to do that. And lo and behold, they too have the Holy Spirit come into them and they become part of the body of Christ. And so day by day, more and more people kept joining this group. This was an outreaching group. And we're not ingrown. Think about this whole description that we've been reading now for two weeks. How different it would read without that last phrase. Without this last phrase. It could be like what Ralph Winter, uh, a scholar and pastor, Dina died recently, uh, described the American church. He said you could write over the whole American church self-actualization cult. And, you know, that could have been the case here, too, except for this last expression. No, it was not just them. It's not just about us. You know, if we go inward then you have corporate selfishness. It's like, yeah, you're giving out, but only to the same people that give back. It's like we're standing in a circle scratching each other's backs. So uh, I'm doing something for someone else, but corporately it's all about us. And that's selfish. Corporate selfishness. The Bible teaches that we, we are blessed. God blesses us. He builds us up. He gives us a, a great uh, revolution in our lives. And He gives us all of these things, the relationships and everything else, so that we can take it and give it away to someone else. You know, when you go into transcendental meditation, why do you do that? You know, if I go into a transcendental meditation and try to learn that, that's for me. And so I can get, like, get the relaxation technique so I can get centered in myself more and stuff. It's all for me. That's the difference when we come to uh, Christianity. It's not about me. It's like I'll build myself up and equip myself so that I can give it out. It's all about giving it out. And so we have the ultimate mark of authenticity and a mark here which, if it's missing, puts the curse on everything that we just read would turn dark and awful if we're missing this last phrase. Something is, by definition, sick in any group where the Lord's not adding to their number day by day those who are being saved. 
Well, there's the description in Acts chapter 2. And I'd like to tie up and wrap up this whole discussion with a few observations about where we're at in Western culture today where I think we have some serious problems. One of the things that sociologists are noticing, especially in America today, is heavy discontent with the, you know, church, the institutional church in America. I mentioned this last week. Books are rolling off the press, several just this year, detailing with, uh, with detailed, careful scientific studies. Apparently, millions are leaving the church. And they're still Christians. But they're like, I just won't go to church. I can't stand it. Josh McDowell says it's been estimated that between 69 and 94 percent of church youth are leaving the traditional church after high school and very few are returning. Well, I, I think probably many of you would be in that category, wouldn't you? I was one. I got out of there the first chance I got. I couldn't stand going to church. And, uh, you know, most people, the, the title of McDowell's book is The Last Christian Generation. His point in this book is that the way things are going right now, we may be the last generation of Christians on the earth. Because up to 90 percent of uh, uh, younger people are like out of here. Boy, we've got problems there. This is uh, Tom and Sam Rayner. They say more than two thirds of young church going adults in America drop out of the church between the ages of 18 and 22. So the numbers are a little hard to pin down exactly, but it's definitely up in that two thirds range. And I would put it at there or even higher. Everyone I meet. It seems like on campus here, you know, it's like I used to go to a church thing and <clears throat> You know, I'm out of there. I don't go anymore. And that's where we're at in our culture. Julia Dwin, her, her book is entitled Quitting Church. She says one of the top reasons people give for leaving their leaving church is loneliness. What? The feeling, especially in large congregations, that no one knows or cares that uh, they're there. Many churches, she says, have become like supermarkets or gas stations, totally depersonalized arenas where most people no longer feel a responsibility to be hospitable to the person standing next to them. As for those who drop out, no one notices. Well, she's just a, she's a researcher. She's one herself. She admits she, she dropped out. Although she's, I guess she's going back into a church now, so uh, she's not hostile. She's not a hostile author. None of these authors I'm quoting are hostile to the church. You know, Tom Rayner is like uh, was high up in the in the Baptist like uh, denominational, you know, uh, whatever. And Josh McDowell. I mean, uh, come on. These are people that are that are like pro Christian people that are saying this. Think about this. Think about this description right here. We come from reading what we just read in Acts. Uh, where they're just in there with each other every day. The closeness, the depth that's there. And then we look at this and it's like people are leaving because they're lonely. Nobody even knows I'm here. Totally depersonalized. And then they go walking out and no one ever notices they're gone. It's true. I don't think it's exaggerated. I mean, I've, I've been right in groups exactly like this. Not just and not just mega churches. I mean, you know, medium and even smallish churches where it's just like there is no engagement. It's not it is depersonalized. Imagine somebody dropping out of one of your home churches and nobody noticed it. That could never happen. I hope this would never happen here. Would it? Oh my gosh, is that pitiful. And so there is none of the cohesive 
uh, uh, that unity that we describe is just lacking. It's just not there. At the same time, and here's the same uh, author, Julia Duin. She says, the people I talk to who have found true community and then must leave it due to family or job reasons, pine for it the rest of their lives. So it's not that people don't want closeness. It's not that they don't want community. She said she interviewed, she talks about the people she's interviewed, and some of them had this experience where they fell in with a group that was taking the New Testament seriously. And they felt it, they experienced the oneness of community. And then, as she said, they had to leave it. Then they must leave it due to family or job reasons. <laughs> uh, family reasons. It's, you leave it because you're getting a job, career advancement in a different city. If it's a family reason, it's because your spouse is getting a career opportunity in another city. It's all about money. That's why Americans move around. Isn't it? You guys live in America. You must know this is true. Uh, maybe occasionally there's other reasons. Okay, okay, but most of it's money. And so, uh, but, uh, but I, I thought it was interesting how she phrased it. It's like, well, they must leave, you know, must. Uh, and then, for the rest of their lives, 20 years later, 30 years later, they're still there like, oh, oh man, that was sweet. I had it. I was there. And they pine for it the rest of their lives. Oh, I don't know whether that strikes you as being as pitiful as it does me. But I can believe it. I totally believe it. Because when you have had real body life, nothing less will do. All the money in the world would never substitute for it. They pine for it the rest of their lives. What a pain. Okay, why would this happen? This is what we need to think about here. Why would this be happening? to the church in America. This question, if the New Testament is so clear about what God calls us to, then why don't we see more credible examples of community practicing what we read here? I'll give you my opinion. I, I come down to two reasons that stand out above all the others. They're certainly not the only ones, but these are, these are pretty freaking bad. The first is something called accommodation. Okay? Accommodation is when you change the uh, content of the gospel to meet the expectations of your audience. Instead of telling your audience what God says, you modify it and accommodate it to their expectations so that you won't be like bothering them with something they don't want to hear. You, won't, you don't want to be too abrasive, so you just accommodate. And what we accommodate to is we accommodate to Western culture's time priorities, which have all to do with uh, the materialism and the world system. And we also accommodate to something called consumer Christianity. Consumer Christianity is a, an understanding of Christianity similar to where, you know, like I go into Myers uh, and I'm, uh, I'm looking for something, right? And I'm going to get something. And yeah, I have to pay out. But the point, the reason I went there is for what I'm going to get. I'm a consumer. The, to consumer Christians, the question is always, what's in it for me? And that's the way they view their faith in Christ. That's the way they view their church. What's in it for me? Well, okay, let's take these on. First of all, when it comes to their time allocations, we talked about this last week. People are like, what, day by day, hanging out with each other? You must be kidding, you know, we're, we're busy. And so uh, we've got this American way of life that has us racing around doing all these crazy, stupid things that don't even amount to anything. Totally unimportant, most of them. And yet we just are so busy, we don't have time for the things of God. That's not the way these guys, they were busy. You realize that people in the ancient culture, like the first century culture, worked six days. 
not five. And they probably worked 12 hour days minimum. They worked. They had families, too. They had to clean their houses, too. Uh, so on and so forth. They didn't have probably to watch as many TV shows as we do. They didn't have that part. These were busy people. But the point is, you don't find time for fellowship. If you understand the body of Christ, you make time for it. You take the most important thing in your life and you, you plot in time for that. And then the less important things, you fit in wherever you can. Right? And that's really what modern Americans are doing, too. We're starting with, let's, that's why the language I call your attention to, where they must leave. The most important things, our money, our career, uh, you know, and so on, comes first, and our entertainment. And then we try to fit in a little bit. If, uh, hopefully we'll have some time to go to church this week. <clears throat> in an accommodated group, people don't make time. Uh, we get, you know, God and the body of Christ get whatever crumbs fall off the table. Look at this statement. Here's another statement. This is from Dewey's book also. This was a guy who left the church recently uh, or, or a year or two ago that she was interviewing. He says, I want to go back, but it takes such a lot of effort to go there after working all week and doing errands on Saturday. And, and if you do go, you want something back. You need your batteries charged. You know, church isn't like that anymore. You don't, you get no return for what you put into it. Okay, I don't know who this guy is. All right. I'm just saying, okay, there it is. That's what I'm talking about right there. Okay. First of all, are the Western time priorities? You know, I spent all day uh, working. I spent all Saturday running my errands. You know, probably had to deck a few things out, you know, and uh, God knows. But I mean, so all of my effort and time has been taken up pursuing the things that I care most about, which is my materialistic Western world system based lifestyle. And now, you know, I'm supposed to get up and I'm really worn out from all of that. Now I'm supposed to get up and go to church on Sunday. It's hard, man. Used up all my juice already. And then he says, and you want something back. He's a consumer Christian. So he's got the Western time priorities and he's a consumer Christian. You just don't get any return uh, from what you put in. That's the way a consumer is. If I'm going to this store and I'm buying a product there, you know, and I realize it costs too much, I'll go to the consumer. I'll go to their competitors store next time it's like i better be getting the good value for what i'm putting out because you know that's that's where it's at for consumers what's the problem with this view contrast this view with the notion that under the biblical view the church is actually a place where you go to serve to suffer and to sacrifice yourself for others This whole consumer mentality that you see reflected in the words here probably couldn't be further away from what God teaches us. No wonder there's a problem. We've put self-gratification at the center and the church has become a, a, uh, you know, a, uh, an entity that gratifies self. But we're not called for self-gratification. We're called to self-sacrifice. If you're a healthy, growing Christian, you go to every meeting of the body of Christ thinking to yourself, praying, Lord, show me someone I can give out to tonight. Oh, God, don't let me go through this whole evening without getting to give out in any way. I don't want to be driving home thinking, man, all I did was take tonight. Spare me from that, God. Show me somebody I can bless, somebody I can encourage, some teaching I can share, some some uh, testimony, some uh, encouragement, something that I can give. That is a little different than the consumer model, isn't it? It's a little different. Yeah. Okay, so think about it now. 
If we're going to we're going to accommodate the consumer mentality. I go to pastors conferences. I, I talk with pastors. OK, I know what they think like. And they're all like, well, you know, if you do this, people don't like that. And they're not going to come to your church. And so it's all about we got to do this. You know, we've been doing this because people really like that. And they'll come for that. And it's about the kind of show you're going to put on. It's about the kind of amenities you're going to offer, you know. And, uh, well, we're thinking about building a, a bowling alley in the bottom basement of our church because people would like that, you know. And, and they're all trying to think about how can we uh, how can we meet the consumer expectations of people and get them to come to our church. <laughs> they're all doomed. They're all doomed. That's not even what the church is for at all. We're here to serve and to suffer and to die. And I think so. I think accommodation is a huge problem. I really do. And I don't think we're ever going to see any any turnaround as long as we continue to to accommodate. And this is really butt kiss theology. Uh, right down the line here. And it's simply, it's not only unbiblical, it just doesn't work, okay? And this is not the only problem. There's one other problem that's pretty severe, and that would be legalism. Legalism is the uh, constant church, the church's constant focus on rules and uh, external performance and avoidance of sin and, and uh, just this very performance type mentality and it kills body life. You cannot grow together closely under a legalistic mentality. When you get into one of these legalistic environments where people are judging the hell out of each other and everything, you you have to try to keep your stuff secret. You certainly cannot risk closeness with people like that. It's like if you had a serious problem, something vile, something dirty, you would have to find some anyone but these people to tell it to. You know, you would hire a therapist. You would not even let that out in a legalistic church environment. And so there's just no basis for closeness. Everybody is really faking it. And people sense this. They sense it's all fakey. It's all external. That's what I hear from people I talk to that have left the church. Is they all seem to say it just seemed real fakey. It seemed real hypocritical. That word comes up a lot. And the reason is because of the legalism. People couldn't be real. They couldn't let down and be real people. Uh, the, the authenticity is lacking. And, uh, and so people are just like, I'm out of here. And like, heck yes. All right. So let's get positive. Let's end on a positive note. What do we need? What is the key? What are the keys uh, to an awesome church? First of all, what we believe. The things that we've been reading about here, beginning with the mystical union, we have to believe that that's real and what God has done for us, that Jesus Christ is real, that our future lies with God. Everything between now and then is, is to be judged on that basis. And uh, we've got to believe it from the heart to the point where it begins to affect our actions and our deeds. And uh, uh, that leads to our expectations. What do we expect? What do we consider normal? In the body of Christ. You know, this is kind of the uh, your DNA. Like, for instance, uh, a group of people. Well, like if uh, two or three of us went to a, a home church meeting, let's say. And uh, we were kind of like, you know, that was a good meeting. You know, it's like, how do we get that judgment? That is uh, those are what goes into a good meeting in the body of Christ. What goes into a good community of people? What, what is uh, how much time should be spent uh, hanging out with each other and building relationships? Questions like that. They're judgment calls. You know, we can't really say, well, in verse so and so, it says this. We, that isn't spelled out that way for us. But our, our theology does develop 
what we consider normal. I was talking to a guy a while back. I was telling him that, you know, hundreds of people in our fellowship come out and take these classes every week that are pretty uh, difficult. You know, they just three hour long uh, lectures and graded uh, assignments and tests and stuff. About a third of them fail each class <laughs> and they pay for it. And they're just like, whoa, whoa. They're just 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 dumbfounded. He's a, this is a pastor. And he's like, how do you get people to do that? Well, I think you just, you know, it's the, it's uh, it's just expected. I mean, uh, I think I think people here just consider this whole picture that we're reading in, in Acts 2 that, that, yeah, that it would be that way. I mean, that's what a that's what a body of Christ is. And so your beliefs become these expectations. And uh, we have to have the willingness to risk breaking away from the status quo and realizing, OK, we're different than other groups. Yeah, good. And uh, I think if we do these things, then that this collection of our beliefs, expectations and so on become the ethos of the group. That's what you call your ethos. And in an ethos, when a group has a certain ethos, they just like share a common sense of the way things are. And when that's based and formed by the biblical picture, it seems uh, actually relatively uh, natural to build the kind of body life we're reading about. It's like nothing less than that would really satisfy us. And so uh, people just go for it. And it's not, uh, I'm not going to say it's not hard because it, it is hard. It is, this is always difficult, but it's, uh, it's, it's enjoyable. Um, it's challenging there. That's a better word. It's challenging, but it's enjoyable. And uh, people eat it up. We don't have to twist anyone's arm. People are just like, I love this. And uh, I just wish I could do more. And that's how it works.